Okay, Steve. Am I ready to go? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Sorry about that. Right, okay. Welcome, everybody. Um, I, I've, there's only really four slides on here, but there's just a couple of things that I wanted to show you to kind of get you in the mood for what I'm going to do, because it's a little different from SF. Um, but it, it's, to me, um, as somebody who's particularly interested in the evolution, evolution of the human race and um, interventions that work, um, this is an underpinning for kind of SF theory. Except SF doesn't have a theory. So. All right, setting the scene. Keep it simple. It ain't that easy. Sometimes I like to just come out here and think outside the box. And that's something that SF does quite a lot. Um, is, is actually take a look at the box and say, no, I don't want to be here. I need to think. I need to be creative. I need to be thoughtful about what I'm doing and not just applying the paradigm. So. And the other thing I wanted to, um, to, to offer to you um, was that the difference between misery and happiness depends on what we do with our attention. If I ask you not to think about pink elephants, what comes to mind? Okay, if I ask you to not think about your problems, what comes to mind? Um, if I ask you to think about your problems, what comes to mind? Okay, so depending on what we pay our attention to depends on how we feel about it. Now, I'm going to skip through all of this lot now, because I want to get to a picture. And like I said, you've seen all this before, in various different formats. Right, this is where I wanted to get to. How many of you have ridden a horse? Donkey. <laughs> Donkey. Okay. okay. Now, the reason that I'm so interested in evolutionary psychology is because we've developed, all organisms have developed behaviours over millions of years. Behaviours that are effective. And one of the observations I want to make is that every single one of your ancestors was successful. How do I know? Because you're here. Okay? And so therefore they carried out a whole load of successful behaviours in order for you to be here. And those, we can trace back um, human behavior about 270 million years, okay, right back to the very, very first um, vertebrate animals, and probably before, but we're, we're pretty sure about vertebrate animals because we can find the record for them, okay, um, and we are based pretty much, all vertebrate animals are based pretty much on the same structure, okay, two arms, two legs, spine, head, etc etc and pretty much the organs are similar as well so there are a lot there's a lot of development of behavior that's gone on over those 270 million years now the reason I asked you if you have any of you ridden a horse is because a horse is a pretty fundamental um, creature in terms of some of the things I want to try and explain about human behavior and what do we know about horses well, I'm, I'm going to do my trick because I always do it on the whiteboard. Um, here we have a horse. Okay, it's in need of a good meal. Now, what do I know about horses? They're emotional. They're physically very powerful. They are also incredibly threat-minded. Can you all see that by the way? Okay. And the other thing is, because horses are incredibly threat-minded, they spook easily. Horses are very hyper-vigilant, we would call it. And this, this is all related to trauma, by the way. So we'll see where we go. The other thing about horses is they live in the moment. They live in the here and now. You don't see horses with insurance policies and mortgages and things like that. And they have two basic emotions. Fear and anger. Fear helps them run, anger helps them fight. And a lot of people would talk about the flight and fight mechanism. Well, human beings are the weirdest creatures on the planet, bar nothing. You could bring me something out of the bottom of the Marianas Trench in the Pacific. It is not as weird as a human being. Okay? 
And the reason we're so, by the way, I'll send you all this material, so you don't need to write anything down. Um, the reason that we're so weird, human beings, is because we're not one creature, we're two creatures. We're two creatures rolled into the same body. One of which is a bit like my anorexic horse. Okay? Um, and the anorexic horse represents something called the survival mechanism. Okay? Which flight and fight is part of the survival mechanism. It's an incredibly powerful mechanism inside our bodies. And in the material I send you, I'll send you a link to a, university, uh, a lecture I do at the university that spends a whole hour describing this single mechanism, okay, in some detail and how it evolved. Now, the survival mechanism is incredibly successful, which is why you're here, because it's kept us alive, and that's what its job is. It does, it says, does exactly what it says on the tin and nothing else. It wants to keep you alive, and the best way it can do that is to keep you out of danger. Now, to give you an example of how it works, if you imagine for a moment that we have a time machine and I take you all back 10,000 years and we're primitive human beings running across the plains of Northern Europe hunting for our lunch and you get mugged by a hyena, okay? Notice it's you, not me. Now, we drag you back to the cave, you lick your wounds, <coughs> get sorted out, eventually you heal and you're ready to go out hunting again. When you go out hunting again, what are you likely to be very careful to avoid? Hyenas, correct. Anything else? Big open plains. Well, you might have got mugged in a wood. Oh, okay. But you, you're right, you would, have got, you, you would avoid the place where you got mugged. And you would also avoid anything that looked like the place you got mugged. But you would also avoid anything that looked like a hyena. So anything else with teeth, claws, fur and four legs would probably become fairly high up your scale of risky objects. Okay? Because this mechanism learns and it builds what in another therapy are called schema. Uh, but they're only certainly just another fancy name for a plan, a map, uh, a protocol, an agenda if you like. Um, to, to enable you to, to define very quickly <coughs> sources of danger. And it does it incredibly quickly, all right? and, it, and it learns like that, but it takes a long time to unlearn it. Okay? So if you, if you get mugged by somebody, um, or if you, well, I'll tell you what, let me just bring you all back in my time machine, you're all healed now, bring you back in my time machine 10,000 years to today. Now if you have a car accident, when you've recovered, assuming you get injured, what are you likely to avoid? Getting in the car? Very, very common. Okay, I deal with an awful lot of car accidents. So people avoid getting in the car. They also find that they have considerable difficulty crossing or being in the place that is similar or the same as the place where the collision occurred. Okay? Um, simply because this mechanism has now built a schema. And when you think about it, it's just common sense. You know? So, this horse, this primitive creature inside us all, not that I'm suggesting that there's a quadruped running around inside you anywhere, but it will do anything to avoid danger. To give you an example, how many of you have had that, that moment where you've got a really kind of exciting night out and you're having to get dressed up for it, whether it's a presentation, a works dance, or something that's kind of, you know you're going to be tested, but it's going to be fun at the same time. Has anybody experienced that? You know, like you're going to win an award, or you, you, it's a big, you know, you're going to go with your partner or whoever else, and it's going to be a big night out. And you're kind of getting ready, and you're all excited. And when you get to the door, you begin to feel a bit anxious. Yeah? Well, the excitement is because you're thinking about how much fun it's going to be, the anxiety is because you're also imagining the things that can go wrong. And the horse is beginning to pick those up. Okay, I'll explain more in a minute. But we get these paradoxical feelings about these situations. Okay? Is that automatic, then? Yeah. 
you don't have any control over it. If it's learned something that's scary, it will respond in a way that wants to try to get you to avoid it. Okay? Now, all of that is going on below your level of awareness. Okay? And it applies to every creature with a backbone. This is learned to be... Well, it's learned and instinctual. I mean, if you take human beings, children or babies automatically respond to things like heights and spiders and sticks and water in an adverse kind of way because they're at risk. Okay? And the ones that obviously avoided those things are the ones that survived. So the avoidant behaviour is innate. So the natural avoidance behaviour would be innate and where people develop irrational fears is, is learned behaviour. It is learned behaviour, yeah. So you can have a bit of both. Yeah. Okay. Now, so far so good? Okay. Sat on the back of the horse is a rider. And the rider is you. Okay? Your awareness. Your sense of self. Your self-awareness. And I, I don't use the word consciousness because I don't know what it means. Okay? But you, broadly speaking, <coughs> are rational, logical, I can't even spell, and pragmatic, which basically means you do what works, okay, most of the time. Now, when we're in a good place, the balance between the horse and the rider is almost perfect. There's no sense of, of kind of imbalance. And we just get on with our lives and we enjoy ourselves and everything else. But when the balance moves slightly towards the horse, when we're miserable, when we're depressed, same thing, anxious, obsessive, myriads of different descriptions for the same thing in my book. Okay? But when the balance moves towards the horse, the rider feels a little bit out of control. And you ask most people who've suffered some kind of psychological distress, the first thing that they feel, or the first thing that they observe, is that they don't feel like themselves. They don't feel in control. They feel like something else is going on. And it's because the horse is now somewhat in the ascendancy. Not much, but just enough to make us feel uncomfortable. But we begin to focus on that because we feel, what's wrong with us? And we immediately ask that question. Now... That, that shift can come from myriads of different reasons, but almost invariably they're contextual. They're based in the environment. We don't, we don't create, um, by and large, we don't create our misery through our own thinking. It is in response to an external environment in some way. There are a few cases that that's not true, but not many. Now, the thing about, for those of you that have ridden a horse, or a donkey, What do you do to get the horse or the donkey to go faster? You kick it or you grip its sides. Right? When we're in this situation, the more you try to get a grip of yourself, and that's a wonderful English expression, the more anxious you become. The more you try to grip on, the more uncomfortable the whole situation becomes. And the more you grip, the faster the horse goes. And that's how panic attacks develop. Bearing in mind that this is just a metaphor, right? I'm not suggesting that you're really riding a real horse. But we try to control those feelings, but the more we pay attention to them, the more we focus upon them, the more we try to get a grip of ourselves, the worse things get. So the whole process has to be counterintuitive. But it gets worse. Okay? Because not only are the two creatures, but one of them has something that's immensely problematic. Imagination. Now, imagination, as far as we're aware, only occurs in human beings. No other creatures, as far as we know. Uh, and the evidence for that is kind of all around us. Because other animals live in a natural environment, whereas we've created an artificial environment, both physically and psychologically. Now, if we think negatively, what 
what happens? We think about something negative, we begin to feel uncomfortable. <coughs> let, let me give you an example of just how powerful this process is. How many of you have had a rom an embarrassing romantic moment? I don't want to know about it. I just want you to picture it. Remember it. Now, as you're, or any kind of embarrassing moment, okay? But as you're remembering that, what is your body doing? You're cringing. Toes are killing me. Yeah, exactly. Okay, now that's a very, very minor kind of experience. But your horse is responding to that embarrassment. Okay, and it's what it's doing in a very minor sort of way is it's preparing your body to do one of two things, either run or fight. Okay, and as it's preparing your body, your heart rate is going up, your breathing is changing, your digestion, digestive system is shutting down, you're beginning to sweat, your senses are becoming much more sensitive, um, you feel like throwing up, you feel like the world's going to fall out your bottom. They're extreme cases, okay, but they are all part of that survival mechanism because they're all there as part of a defense mechanism. Now, if anybody wants to ask me what they do, I will tell you. But the bottom line is that they are all things that have evolved to help keep you alive. And the people whose bowels evacuated or who threw up or whose senses became hypersensitive, um, whose heart rate went up, breathing changed, they were all the ones that survived. So these are the physiological behaviours that have been inbred into our systems. Okay? And we have no control over them. But yet they're treated as symptoms if you look at a medical model of psychology. Okay? They're not. They're natural, normal processes. Now, you imagine something negative, you communicate it to the horse. And the horse begins to react immediately. So a focus on problems is invariably going to invoke this mechanism at some level. So you're actually creating arousal simply by focusing on the problem, the feared object. And of course, as soon as we begin, begin to become aroused and we produce adrenaline in response to an, a, a, a feared situation, our capacity to think is reduced. So a problem focus actually is really unhelpful. Literally, psychologically and physiologically, okay? Now, so that's kind of the negative model, all right? And that's the traditional way that psychotherapy and medics and everybody else deal with psychological problems. They focus on the problem, which actually makes it much more difficult to process. But if you begin to think about what it is you want and think about all the things that might work, and you think about the possibilities, the horse doesn't react. So your level of arousal reduces, you begin to feel more comfortable, you're able to process more effectively, and the possibilities become louder. Does that make sense? Okay? So, at that point I'm going to stop and I'm going to tell you a couple of little metaphors. After I've had a slurp of tea. And to just very sum, sum up that very quickly, oops. Okay, the horse is primitive, emotional, with simple emotions, it's threat minded, it's powerful, it lives in the here and now, and it has primitive drives. The rider is pragmatic, logical, selfish, moral, ethical, intellectual, spends most of its time in the past or the future, and it has complex motivations. Those two are in conflict inside every single person. Okay? There's always a conflict between this kind of higher level thinking and this primitive response. Mm. And that's one of the things that we have as human beings to learn to deal with. Can I ask a question? Sure. This, my, my simple understanding of the fight and flight was all tied in with the amygdala. Mm -hmm. and, that's and, the base of the survival mechanism. Yeah, and so I'll share it with you because it's something I've been talking about. Um, there's a, a, a free climber called Alice Honnold who climbs without ropes yeah. and when they put him through an MRI scan they found that his amygdala was healthy but inactive yeah. which means he can focus on what he does extremely well which exactly. is climbing without worrying about falling off yeah. and is that pretty well 
Pretty well sums up. What you're talking about. Yep, yeah. absolutely. His his rider is completely in charge, and the horse his horse is not active. Is not active. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And that's not true for most people. Yeah. Also, those quite. I've just been starting to read a bit about yin and yang as well, and there's a bit of there's a bit of that in there as well. The two sides. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. You need a bit of both. You, you can go right through religion. There's always you, a double thing, isn't there? Yeah. yeah. It's yeah. always this. I mean, it's interesting. I was at a psychological, um, a philosophical meeting last Wednesday, uh, where they were talking about black and white and duality. Okay. Um, and that was really interesting. Um, I, I, not very much to say in it, but I had a few things to say. But it, it's, this is the kind of thing that all these different aspects are bringing out throughout the years, mm. thousands of years now that humans have been philosophizing about their state. And it is this conflict, this constant conflict. But why it's interesting about this guy is how can he be so confident? And it's not confidence per se, is it? It's just the fact he's not got this physiological thing to deal with. He's trained himself yeah. not to have to deal with that yeah. physiological problem. My guess is that you, I mean, I don't know, but you put him in a different circumstance, the amygdala might go mad. Well, well, he professes to get nervous watching himself on films doing Yeah, it, can you imagine? He's never nervous when he's doing Don't it. You? No, because his, his, his concentration is, yeah. is total. So he's not abnormal in that sense, no. he's just controlled <clears throat> it. Yeah. yeah, he's just managed it. Yeah. And my guess is that most incredibly successful people, in one, one form or another, are totally in control of this process. You know, they're managing it, they've trained themselves to deal with this and get their attention where they need it, so that the horse isn't frightened. Whereas the rest of us mere mortals spend most of the time trying to deal with our horse and not focusing on what it is we want to do. A couple of uh, metaphors for you. How many of you have um, remember the story of Little Red Riding Hood? Yeah? yeah. Little Red Riding Hood Grandma's ill in her cottage in the forest. Little Red Riding Hood goes to visit her. And she goes into the cottage. And she goes upstairs into Grandma's bedroom. And then she has this long convoluted, convoluted conversation with Grandma about teeth and claws and ears and eyes and things. Can't she see it's a wolf? You know? Uh, anyway, eventually it dawns on her that there's a wolf in the bed, not Grandma. And she screams and she runs out of the cottage and she's running through the forest to get away from the wolf. Which way is she looking? It's a great question, this, for people um, who, who are suffering from psychological distress. Behind it. Okay, so you, what happens when you're looking behind you and you're running through a forest? Bang into something. Yeah, you run into something. You're doing it wrong, Chris. Yeah. Okay. Face face. <laughs> what happens if you're looking forward? You know where you're going. You can see where you're going. Okay. The reality of it is, and this comes back to signs of safety that we talked about earlier, if you're looking where you're going, you're running towards safety. If you're looking behind you, you're running away from danger. Okay? And the thing is that you look behind you while you're running, you slow down anyway, so the wolf's more likely to get you, but you're also more likely to run into other stuff as well. Okay? So you're far better off getting your head down and concentrating exactly like your chap on his rock faces, not thinking about the danger, but totally absorbed in his safety. Does that make sense? The second metaphor is a bucket of water. Now I want you to imagine that your head is a bucket of water, which it is mostly, about 80%. Okay? And the water inside your head are your thoughts. Okay? And when you're in a good place, the water in the bucket is sweet, it's clean, you drink it, you'd wash in it. Okay? However, when we become depressed, miserable, anxious, distressed in any form, it's like somebody's poured a bottle of black ink into the water. And the water then becomes cloudy and grey and you wouldn't want to wash in it, you wouldn't want to drink it. Okay, you can't tip the bucket over, you can't bail it out, you can't drill a hole in it because it's your head. How do you change the water in the bucket back to being sweet and clean again? Put more good stuff in. Exactly. You pour in more sweet, clean water. Now, it takes time but it will dilute the ink and of course it can flow out over the sides because thoughts come and go all the time. But the crucial thing to remember is that you can't get rid of the ink. You cannot filter the ink out. 
Okay, you cannot. Ironically, my 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 opinion of of psychiatric medications these days is, by and large, they bleach the water. So you've actually finished up with an even more toxic mess that kind of looks clean. Okay, um, that may not be terribly accurate because they do help for some people. But the bottom line is that it takes time and effort of thinking about what it is you want, where you want to get to, how you want to get there, not necessarily, um, but all of those things that solution focused practice does is pour in the sweet clean water that helps to dilute the negative stuff. Okay? And this kind of for me underpins why SF practice is so important. Because it's taking us in the direction, it's fitting in with our physiology, it's fitting in with our evolution. It is not going against the grain. So it's a naturally focused process that fits with our psychology. Interestingly enough, I think it is a paradigm shift in the way that we think. Because if we start thinking about what we want, that will be the first time in human history that that's ever happened as a collective. Individuals have done, but by and large, societies and governments, governments and things like that have always been problem focused, which is why we now need a paradigm shift. Okay? Finally, I want to tell you about the emotional bank account. How am I doing for time, by the way? Um, what time did you start? 145? Just after 145. You've got uh, another 12 minutes. Another 12 minutes. Is, is that in total, or is that to the question time? Um, to the question time. Oh, okay, good. Yeah. Can I ask a quick question? Sure. Uh, the, you talked about the ink. You yeah. can't clean out the ink. Is yeah. there a default default to having dark thoughts? And what differentiates people who have a problem with it and people who are more healthy emotionally? Is they just better equipped at clearing out the dark thoughts? or the, the, Well, their, their attention is much more on the better thoughts. Right, but there are always those dark thoughts as well as they, mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, it's, who knows? Yeah. I, I, I have no idea, all I know is what goes on inside my head. I have no, yeah. I, absolutely no idea what goes on in other people's heads at all. But I do know that there are always dark thoughts yeah. in there, usually towards the end of the month, and I'm worried there isn't going to be enough money to pay the bills. Um, but other than that, um, we all have dark thoughts. It's about how, what, we, what attention we pay to them. And, and what we need to do about them, if anything, to get rid of them. Is that why some people are giving them antidepressants too? Yeah, it bleaches the water. But it, it, it lifts them. It lifts because them. Because they, they pay more. less attention to the negative thoughts. But then they're able to do it themselves. themselves yeah. Or they go back to the way they were. Now, how many of you got a bank account? Yeah? Okay. Well, here's my version of a bank account. Okay, you've got a positive balance, a negative balance, you've got an overdraft limit. You also have an emotional bank account. And, and when it comes to dealing with trauma, this is incredibly important. Because, well, let me give you a perfect bank account to start with, and then I'll describe what a trauma account looks like. And a perfect emotional bank account would look something like this. We're born with a positive balance, we go through childhood, we pay into that account. And we pay in through our relationships with family, friends, fun, finances, security, all the positives in life. Then we get to adolescence. Don't remember that? All over the place. Okay? And we come out the other side, bloodied but unbowed, and we go on into adulthood. And if we had a perfect bank account, it would look something like that. Nobody, not even David Beckham, has a bank account like that. Payments out of our account, trauma, loss, bullying, stress, all the negatives of life. Okay? Uh, but provided that there's a penny more paid in than there is paid out, all is sweetness and light. Okay? Now, a more realistic emotional bank account. Pulling along quite happily. Minor setback in life, i.e. your car is stolen, you drop. Requires emotional effort to get over that. Step forward, new job, new relationship, etc., etc. 
A bank account rebuilds itself because you're getting payments in through fun stuff, good stuff, and all the rest of it. Then there's a major setback, maybe the end of the relationship or the loss of the job, and you dip below that zero line. But you have an overdraft limit, so you just dip into your overdraft for a bit. Really low point, minor depressive symptoms and or anxiety. And then life picks up again uh, and stabilizes, and you get back up to where you were before, or possibly even better. And, and all, most people will have ups and downs in their lives similar to that. Make sense? Is that realistic? Yep. Okay. A trauma bank account. Pondling along quite happily. Traumatic event, collision, personal injury, unexpected death, serious injury of a loved one. I've just said that, it says as a loved one, I've never noticed that before. Um, battlefield injuries, refugee ship, um, escaping from torture, all sorts of things. Anything at this point can cause a massive demand on our emotional bank account. But what happens is when we get to the overdraft limit, is that instead of beginning to pick up again, we begin to become avoidant and we become threat minded and we focus on the losses, whatever they happen to be, and we begin to bounce along the bottom. And each time we get a little bit back into their account, we pay it out by attending to the threat. So we no longer um, continue to. Um, to, to bounce back simply because our attention, as I pointed out in the first slide, that our attention, what we attend to determines whether we're happy or miserable. Um, we, because we're now sp spending all our time being hypervigilant trying to avoid the threat or the potential threat of whatever it is that might happen again, we continue just to bounce along this line. And our behaviours change and they become deeply ingrained the longer it lasts. But then, if we begin to focus on what is wanted, we begin to focus on a new reality. We change that attentional focus, which is what we've talked about in the last two and a half days here. Then we begin to focus on what we want. Then the whole definition of our lives begins to change again, back to the kind of stuff that we wanted or we had previously. Now, for some people, their lives have been like that all the time. And it is much harder to get them to focus on what life would be like if they weren't in the threat situation. But again, patience, time, thoughtful questioning about what is wanted, maybe using role models, noticing other people, things like that, will make a huge difference to the person that you're working with. So it isn't necessarily something that they have knowledge of, provided you can begin to help them to draw on their knowledge of other people, indirectly, or situations, movies, anything you like that they've noticed that helps them to describe what it is they would like. Okay. How is it relevant? Okay. What about the miracle question or preferred future? What are we doing when we're mining the person's desired future? We use getting them to use their imagination to imagine something that doesn't yet exist but could do. It has the potential to exist for them. We use our imagination in every other part of our development through our lives, trying to imagine what it is we want. It's laden with emotion, which is why if you look at a problem focus, all you're doing is focusing on the things that you don't want. That doesn't mean that we're problem phobic, of course we're not. But the attention is always brought back to what is wanted. And at that point, I think, I will stop. Any questions? <coughs> you, uh, you sent me that to uh, the graph, the bank account. I oh, did I? <coughs> A while back, yeah, when we first... Oh, spoke. that's right, <coughs> yes I did, yeah. And uh, the chap, uh, that I mentioned today was uh, got the anxiety issues, yeah. and uh, I actually showed him that we discussed it together really, and uh, it absolutely resonated with him. It's like it wasn't a breakthrough, but it, it totally 
got where he was because he'd had a traumatic experience and he was, he says, I do feel as though I make a little bit of progress. He says, but I'm in this state of using all my energy up, worrying about stuff and so it just bounces on the bottom. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, you can absolutely see. Yeah. Good. Well thank you for that. That's yeah. a nice piece of feedback. Yeah. Very good. I've got a million and different one things that I'm trying to spin round my head and, and process. Should I go back to that graph? If you don't mind. Because right. you kind of got me. Lost me. Whereabouts? Uh, well, you didn't, no. We didn't lose me. At the point where you said antidepressants um, are bleach the water. Oh, yeah. Um, <coughs> I was a bit kind of taken aback by quite a definitive kind of, I almost took that as like a negative. So, you've got trauma in your life, you come down just below you in your overdraft, and you can get up by a nice thought, yeah? At all? Yeah. So, it's kind of, you know, the ups and downs of, of life and using your resources and and not having a traumatic event that puts you down, right down on that bottom yeah. line where, you're, where, you, where you've spent everything that you've got. Yeah. So my interpretation of that, so you're hitting that bottom as a result of trauma. Now avoidant, to me, is not just what you describe. I'm not saying that's not kind of what could happen with, with um, trauma. Avoidant to me is almost hitting that red line, avoiding and not acknowledging, and using either fight or flight in a way that fills you with sweet, happy water, because you're avoiding, avoiding it so you can live the rest of your life or follow what would be a normal pattern. And then all of a sudden, there's a trigger, for whatever, whatever reason that is, and you back down onto the red line. Yep. At that point there, you've avoided. You've avoided. You haven't been stuck in this cycle of bumbling along the oh. bottom because you've gone straight back up, be, what, using whatever resources as, as being the rider mm -hmm. and harnessing whatever it is in the horse that helps you to get through these things. So the second time you've hit the bottom line, where at that point would you then recognise about the avoidance that perhaps you needed to have addressed it? And therefore that's the opposite as, of SF. No, it isn't, not at all. The, the thing is that you... I mean, it's a really interesting question. Thank you for asking it. Um, but the reality of it is that you, how, I mean, first of all, the question in SF would be, how would you know that you had addressed it? But if you address it in the present by saying, what behaviours can you change? I mean, this, this is this, this thing about, um, people talk about denial or, or all these other kind of things about their past or needing to go back and address it. My problem for some, as somebody who's worked in trauma for 25 years, is that people make this assumption that they need to go back to address it, but actually what they need to do is to accept it. And they need to learn from it, not try to do something about it, because you can't change your past. Yeah, yeah but we don't live in a culture where people are told that. No, I know that. No, yeah, I agree. Yeah. That's, what I'm trying to, that's why I'm trying to get this message across. And if you're right at the bottom of your line, wouldn't it... I don't know whether I've, I've like kind of feel. Are, are you suggesting that this thing is still drawing on you? Um, no, I think kind of to to where to move forward to. I suppose there's two two questions for me. How much do you need to address about the trauma, um, about what happened, and not necessarily the detail of it, but your understanding and making sense of Ooh. to be able to move forward. And if you're struggling to get off that red bottom line then isn't kind of therapy, as well as some temporary artificial medication aid, all right to be able to 
support somebody to be able to get back off that Sure, but that's, that that's what SF does. I mean, the interesting thing, I, I, I'm quite critical now of medications, um, simply because the, there is increasing evidence that actually fewer and fewer medications have any impact at all. And I suspect that that's because the human psyche has changed. Not because the medications have got worse, but simply we now view them in a different light. We're much more skeptical of them, so they're less likely to work. Okay? Mm -hmm. um, but to take your point, if when I work with simple trauma, a single trauma, tra traffic accident or something like that, I don't focus on what went wrong, I focus on how they survived it, yeah. how they managed to cope with it, mm -hmm. the skills and talents that got them through yeah. it. And so they begin to notice all of those things instead of that momentary loss of control that may have caused it in the first place, if it was a car accident mm -hmm. or stepping off a ladder. Yeah. Or... Can I ask a question? When you talk about trauma in, in this context, you're talking about the response to the event, not the event. No, you're talking about... So, well, it is the response to the event, yeah, okay. So, but, I mean, when you say you, you work in trauma, does that include working with some people who are really quite, for most people, innocuous events or somehow cause them to respond? No, I'm, I'm talking about that? battlefield victims. So, so convinced you, yeah, what you would, yeah. PTSD, yeah as, as, yeah, as it would be described in DSM-5. And, and you wouldn't typically see those kind of responses in most other contexts? Um, for most people, I mean, I see people who've got what they call adjustment disorders as a result of traffic accidents or yeah. things like that. Yeah. Um, they, have a, they have a minor disconnection if you like, or disruption of their lives, relatively minor, but because they, they might be more or less normal in the rest of their lives. Though usually, even a car accident will impact upon other aspects of a person's life, whether it's their social life, whether it's their working life, simply because their mobility is affected. Um, working, uh, accidents at work are another good example. People find it very difficult to go back into the same environment. And yet, you know, well, it wasn't that serious an event. Why are you responding like this is often the question. And it's because the horse is doing the black and white thing of saying, last time you went in there, you got hurt. It's stupid to go back there. And so if complex trauma, long-term child abuse, things like that, often that behavior is very deeply ingrained. But the question would still be the same. How on earth did you manage to keep going? How did you manage to survive it? What did you, what did you do that enabled you to keep going? So even though they're bouncing along the bottom, I'm asking questions about what kept them going. Because that's the stuff that gets them out of it. Not trying to dispel, get rid of the ink of the horribleness that somebody else did to them. And, and that's really part of the issue for me, because an awful lot of people say, I need to get restorative justice. I need to get something to happen to the other person. Well, of course, if that doesn't happen, they're stuck. But if you begin to look at how they manage to cope with it, then they can begin to get out of it. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Does that help? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it does. Good. Anything else? And I mean, in SF, I, I, we have some, I haven't put it up there because I haven't got time, but. We do something called a forensic interview, um, which is a really detailed examination of whatever happened to them. Now, I used to do that in a very kind of detailed way, looking at all of the five senses. I don't do that anymore now. If, if I feel, and I, it's becoming rarer and rarer that I do it, simply because once the person gets the idea that actually they managed to survive it, then they begin to build their own ideas about how they manage to survive it. But if they do, if, if, if there is a sense that, that that's necessary, then I look at the event in terms of how they managed to survive it, what they did that got them through it. And very quickly, a very classic example of the um, Switch Island. Everybody know? Oh, you won't know Switch Island. It's a horribly complicated roundabout system between the M57 and the M58 and the A59. It's a horrible junction. Uh, and I had a chap there on Boxing Day about three or four years ago. He's a gas man, a gas fitter. Uh, and he'd been out to an emergency and he just solved it and he was coming back. Um, and, and he was looking forward to having his, his Boxing Day curry or whatever it was. And he stopped at the end of the M58 and there were two lads racing, one in an X, um, a BMW X5 uh, and one in an Audi Quattro. Uh, and they didn't know the road and they came around that bend because obviously they were excited going through all the snaky bit at the end of the motorway, um, came around the final bend 
and just one of them ploughed right at the back of him about 80 miles an hour. Um, and that was, that was okay. I mean, his handbrake was on and everything else. He got a big shock. Um, but the impact was such that he was shunted towards a lorry that was coming from Southport. And this lorry was a 40-tonner. It wasn't very far away. And he thought he was going to be pushed in front of it and would have been mangled. But he put his foot on the brake. He braced himself against the steering wheel, which isn't always very smart, but he wasn't going to hit something in front of him. Um, and the car, the vehicle he was in, the van stopped, and the, the truck went past about that far in front of him. And he was in a bit of a state, and the first thing he heard, because it was a higher van, was a voice coming from the dashboard saying, we think you've had an impact, are you injured? Now, a voice coming out of nowhere, kind of like that, really threw him. He'd never heard anything like this before. And if any of you have seen any of the um, Die Hard movies, there's a car that does that there. All right? Have you, have you seen that? It's really funny. It's a great little vignette. But the, the bottom line was that he, his knee had been fractured on the dashboard. He didn't know that. Um, he'd got very severe whiplash. He'd got a broken finger from gripping the steering wheel. Um, but the first thing he did after the truck had gone past and bearing in mind, this vehicle had been shunted nearly 50 feet by the impact, right? Uh, he jumped out of the vehicle, and he ran round it, and, and he'd been sat there for maybe a minute after it had happened. And, and there was another car pulled up, and there was this woman getting out. And, and he was, I mean, he was a big bloke, and his, his first response to most things was to go and beat the crap out of whoever had done it, right? And, and he was running around the side of the van, and he wasn't aware of all the blood running down his knee. Um, and this woman leapt out of this other car and said, don't do it! And, and he kind of looked at her and paused and she said, I'm a police officer. Because she knew, she could see what he was going to do, the look on his face and everything else. And at this moment, as he was telling me this, I said, how, because he said, I stopped and I went and sat on the barrier. And I just said to him, how did you do that? And the whole of the rest of the conversation was about how he got back in control of himself from that moment. And we never explored the rest of it at all. We didn't need to because at that moment, instead of feeling out of control, which he had done ever since the collision had happened, because he, all he remembered was wanting to go and punch this guy's lights out, what he remembered now was being in control. And that was how the whole thing shifted. Because I was just so shocked. You know, how did you manage to stop and not go, this, irrespective of this policewoman, Irrespective of that, how did you manage to stop yourself? And I mean, the guy had actually been very seriously injured, so it wouldn't have been very smart to go and beat the crap out of him anyway. But he noticed something about himself that he'd never noticed before. So he was speaking to you because he felt out of control. Yeah. And well, he'd been sent to me because he would no longer get in a vehicle. He was no longer. He, he wouldn't, wouldn't, he wouldn't drive. Vehicle, yeah. He wouldn't drive. And so what you? You allowed him to consider was actually he knows how to get in control. He knows, how to, keep he knows control. how to keep control of himself, and that was all. That was the only question I ever asked him about the collision. We talked about all sorts of other stuff, but in terms of the collision, that was the only question he I ever asked. Drag all that trauma back. No, up, did not at all. Didn't need to. And I didn't know that that question was going to produce the solution. I wasn't. I'm not prescient in that way. It was just I was so amazed that he managed to stop as he described stopping and looking at this woman and then going and sitting on the barrier. They just asked the question, how did you do that? And then he began to realise for himself, well how did I do that? And then the focus of his attention changed completely. So, I shall pause at that point because I notice you're... Well, I don't know whether this is going to come out very coherently, I don't think you I suspect it's probably not, but there's something for me, there's something that, that doesn't, that's a bit, well obviously it's a simplification anyway and it's only a metaphor, mm. but there's something about the separation of the rational and the emotional that doesn't work for me, because there's, and, and you and I have previously talked about the, the involvement of the limbic system and, yeah. and emotions in, in solution-focused therapy and how the solution-focused process isn't a purely, isn't a isn't cognitive, it is not a cognitive no, therapy, no. or not entire, not, not solely a cognitive therapy, it's kind of everything all mixed in. Um, and I remember, I think it was, is it Damasio, who, who writes about, the, who writes about the, the, the importance of emotion mm. in actually 
making rational decisions. Absolutely. And the, yeah. the, if you if you took away somebody's emotions. Um, how would you decide, you know, what, where you were going to have your lunch or, um, you know, what job you wanted or who you were going to talk to or how you were going to spend your time? The emotions and rationality go hand in hand. You can't take, you, you can't take them apart like that. They're, they're kind of, they function together. So we, because how we feel about things or how we anticipate feeling about things, how we remember feeling about things, Ooh. is going to feed into the decisions we make about going forward. Absolutely. I wouldn't disagree with that. So, yeah. all, all I'm talking about is the, is the imbalance between the two. I mean, the, the classic example of that was Phineas Cage, which Damasio dis, um, dissected in great detail. And I think for me, the imbalance is a different imbalance. Maybe it's not an imbalance, it's a mismatch. It's a mismatch between how people are living their lives now and how they want to be living their lives. And that, that it's that, that that's the mismatch. Okay. So even in the example of trauma, where you've got somebody that's had a, a really traumatic event, like, like a, a car accident or something, um, it's up to them whether they want to live the rest of their life avoiding oh. cars and not, you know, it, who's to say that it's rational for to get back in the car after you've been involved in a horrendous accident? I would agree. Who's to say it's rational that we all drive anyway, you yeah. know, and take our, our lives in our, our hands. and other people's lives in our hands? It's, like, it's So it's what's right for the person, isn't it? Yeah, well. absolutely. So, oh, yeah. I mean, yeah. you've got to bear in mind that when I see people, they've come because they want to come because they want to make changes. Yeah. They haven't, they, ha they may have been sent by the, the insurance company, but only because they said, I need to do something in order to get my life back on track. Yeah. Well, I had a guy who had a really bad experience. He was a, he was a truck driver. Um, been doing it for years and years and years. And he had a horrendous experience where it was a case of mistaken identity. And he got kind of pulled out of his, of his wagon by the police and kind of treated really roughly. And it totally destroyed his whole world view and his view of you know authority and police. and, and we started out, you know, down the route of well, what would it look like if you were. He sort of, he sort of was part of him that thought about wanting to go back to work again, but another part of him that really thought that this wasn't right for him. And actually, the solution-focused questioning process led to the conclusion that actually he didn't, we didn't want to go back yeah. to that anymore. Yeah. That it wasn't, that it, that it just wasn't going to work for him because of that experience, and mm. he'd got a different view of the world now and yeah. could never go back. And who, who was I to say that that was irrational? You know, that was his Absolutely. experience. Perfectly, perfectly right. So, I don't know, whatever, 35, 40 years as a, as a truck driver, and then this happens, and he didn't, it was not right for him to think about going back. So he thought about rebuilding a different life instead. Yeah, absolutely. So, I, yeah. I, I've just really reinforced that. I've, yeah. I've got an ex squaddy that I'm seeing at the moment. And, I mean, we've, we've seen, we actually wrote up one of my experiences with a yeah. soldier, which is published. Um, but this particular guy, awful experiences um, in, um, uh, in Iraq and Afghanistan um, and it basically he became very very ill um, and he, he's been sent to me we've been talking various different ways about what's happened to him um, what, what he wants to do where he wants to go and he doesn't want to be a soldier anymore he now wants to retrain as a helper and, and one, of the, uh, one of the things that he's talked about and asked me about is whether he wants to come on one of these courses or whether he, whether he could come on one of these courses. And I said, yeah, absolutely. Um, simply because he likes the way that I ask the questions. But he wants to change his life. He doesn't want to, he doesn't, he's not interested in the money. I mean, he used to get 12 grand a month um, for going out and doing close protection. Um, he doesn't want to do any of that anymore. He wants to do something completely different. And I'm not saying, well, the only skills you've got as a soldier, what I'm saying is, okay, so what would be the first small step? It's, so it's, always, it's always about the client's solution, <coughs> not what <coughs> other people yeah. think the solution yeah. is. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Always. Yeah. Right. Excellent. Thank you, Steve. So there you go. Okay.